everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And I have to say it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we have people registered from all over the world, from US to Europe to the Middle East. It's, it's just amazing. Um, so thank you so much. And if we can go to the next slide. I wanted to welcome everybody here today. Um, and, uh, and we have a day planned that we didn't actually create. We worked really closely with our patient and family community to, to see what their needs were. Um, so we have been working with Alejandra and Jonathan for months now and um, really trying to understand along with um, other patients who have um, called and we've spoken with them to really understand their journey in PKD, um, the struggles that they go through and, um, and what kind of questions they have, especially now as the science is evolving um, and there's so much more to learn. So we have created an agenda today where we go through aspects about the gene therapy program here at Rocket, but we also hear from Alejandra and Jonathan about their perspective and, and, and what they have gone through over the past 15 years um, in learning to be where they are today with PKD. Um, we have also really, really grateful to our panel of experts who have gathered here today um, to help answer some questions. So the questions that we have included to be answered in this presentation are questions that we have gotten from patients themselves from all over the world. And there are more questions that we will welcome in the chat. If we don't have time to get through them, please continue to send them because we will answer each and every question. Um, we will get go to our experts, we will answer your questions and we will get back to you, each and every one of you. So thank you so much um, for um, helping build this presentation. And then lastly, I'll close out with just um, what we do here um, in the Rocket patient advocacy team and how we can and help uh, the patients and the families and connect them with the right people. So I have joined Rocket, my name is Latika Hickey. I have joined Rocket uh, just a few months ago, really around the time when COVID hit. Um, and I have been partnering with our pa rare disease patient and families. I've been partnering with clinicians and experts from all around the world to really um, ensure that the right resources are provided to our families um, who are affected by rare diseases. And I have to tell you that in my role here, um, I talk to patients and families almost on a daily basis across our five programs. Um, and it's one of my, it's, it's something that um, helps drive our, our programs and as well as um, helps me bring the patient voice to everything that we do here at Rocket. So if we could go to the next slide. Paulina Weber, who is on the on the line here, um, is um, going to provide any technical support. If anyone on the line here um, uh, needs uh, any help with, if they're stuck, they can't get their questions, or um, or or just needs any support, please call Paulina. Her number is listed on the slide. And if there are questions that um, you would like um, as the conversation um, goes on throughout the webinar please hit the chat button and, um, and insert your question. If um, we will try our best to answer it. And if we run out of time, um, as I said before, we will get back to you by email. So the next slide. Thank you. Here, uh, we wanted to, before we get started, we, we wanted to see um, where you all are coming from. And panelists, you can't answer the question because we know where you're coming from. <laughs> However, um, our patients and families, um, if you could take a moment to answer, that would be great. Just a few more seconds and I will be closing the, the poll. We're almost there anyways.
Wow, amazing. We've got, we, Europe has overtaken our, uh, our webinar today. That's amazing. We've got 10 um, participants from Europe. We've got one from Central and South America, and we have three from the Northeast. So welcome. And we have one more quick question, um, just so we can get a sense of who you are. Um, what, which of the following best describes you? Are you a, a person living with PKD? Are you a caregiver, both a patient and a caregiver, a friend or family member of a patient with PKD, or a healthcare provider caring for PKD patients or other? We're almost there, so just give it a few more seconds and we will close the poll. Okay, so it looks like there are 42% of, of the participants are patients and a caregiver. Um, then we've got friends and family members of the patient with PKD. So people who also care of, have, have loved ones with PKD, a couple of healthcare providers and, and some others. So welcome. Okay, so if we could go to the next slide. I would like to introduce my colleague, Nicole, Eileen Nicoletti. Um, she is an amazing um, colleague who is really passionate about her work um, here at Rocket. Um, she's also leading the gene therapy program here and um, is going to give a quick overview of the program. A more detail, detailed video um, has been recorded by Eileen, which will be provided um, after the webinar to the community. Thank you, Latika. Hello, everyone, and welcome. As Latika mentioned, my name is Eileen Nicoletti, and I'm the medical director here at Rocket for the PKD program. A little bit of background about me. I'm a pediatric hematologist and oncologist by training, and I joined Rocket about two years ago. I'm really honored uh, to be here today with you um, to discuss the ongoing clinical trial uh, for adults and children with severe PKD, answer any questions you might have, and most importantly for me, learn about PKD uh, from the patient community. The goal of the current clinical trial is to insert a functional copy of the PKLR gene, which is mutated in patients with PKD, into, patient, into a patient's blood stem cells, which are the, stems, are the cells in the body that mostly live in the bone marrow and produce red blood cells as well as white blood cells and platelets. The hope is that those stem cells that are genetically modified by our gene therapy to contain the functional PKLR gene, when reinfused into the patient, will produce blood cells that contain a functional pyruvate kinase enzyme, enabling red blood cells to survive and function normally reducing and eliminating the anemia experienced by PKD patients. While gene therapy trials similar to the current one have been conducted in a number of different blood and immune disorders, this is the first in human gene therapy trial for PKD. This trial will try to determine the safety and preliminary efficacy of gene therapy for PKD, first in adult patients, and then in pediatric patients, and look for early indicators that the therapy is effective. As Latika mentioned, I'll provide a brief overview of the study now, but more detailed information can be found on our website, the Rocket YouTube channel, and uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Go to the next slide, please. So who is eligible to, to enroll in the PKD uh, gene therapy clinical trial? So first, patients must have a confirmed diagnosis of PKD, as well as a confirmed PKLR mutation uh, by genetic testing. 
as I mentioned, the first uh, group of patients or cohort of patients that will be evaluated in the study are adult patients ages 18 to 50. And once preliminary uh, safety and efficacy has been evaluated in these patients, pediatric patients will be considered for enrollment. Starting with older pediatric patients ages 12 to 17, followed by younger pediatric patients ages 8 to 11. Patients uh, must also have a history of uh, severe anemia um, in our adult patients, and also pediatric patients must have a, a transfusion uh, requirement despite having their spleen removed. Some reasons why patients may be ineligible for the study include if they have an additional um, uh, reason, uh, an, an additional cause of hemolysis or red blood cell breakdown, if they are pregnant, um, if, if they have severe iron overload, if they've had a, um, a blood clot or a heart attack within the prior 12 months, or if they're currently taking another investigational drug. Paulina, you can go to the next slide, please. If a patient is interested in participating in the clinical trial and provides informed consent uh, to undergo evaluation, eligibility for the clinical trial will be further evaluated during the screening or the pre-study evaluation period, as indicated here on the slide. The, clin the clinical trial physician uh, will take a, a thorough clinical history, perform a physical exam, and conduct a number of blood tests and other assessments to further determine if the patient meets the criteria for the study and if it's safe to undergo procedures required. And this screening period takes approximately one month. So once the patient um, is determined to be eligible and agrees to participate, he or she will undergo stem cell collection. Stem cell collection takes approximately one week and will require inpatient hospitalization for at least a portion of the time. Patients will be given medications by injections underneath the skin to help the stem cells move from the bone marrow out into the circulating blood. After several days of receiving these medications, patients' blood will be collected through an IV and pass through a machine called an apheresis machine, which separates the stem cells from other components of the blood. Some patients will need a, um, a special IV known as a, an apheresis uh, catheter. And this, this IV is typically placed in a large vein by a surgeon while the patient is under anesthesia. The remaining blood will be returned to the patient uh, once the stem cells have been collected. Um, and then that catheter, if it's required, removed. The patients will then be discharged uh, from the hospital and those stem cells that were collected sent to a special lab uh, where a functional copy of the PKLR gene will be inserted and quality checks conducted. And this process takes approximately 12 weeks. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there um, if there are any questions that I can, um, that I can answer um, that, we've, that we've received. I believe one of I, them, I, sorry, uh, Latika, go ahead. Hi, Eileen, we've gotten one question around transfusions. And the question is, how many transfusions are needed to be considered transfusion dependent for purposes of eligibility? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, so in terms of the uh, transfusion uh, dependency, we're defining that as uh, having a requirement for at least six red blood cell transfusion episodes over a prior one year period, or at least three red blood cell transfusion episodes per year over two years. Are there any additional questions that would make sense to answer now or, or shall I continue? And we have another question. Um, 
from Carl. Um, how is the new PK gene inserted? Oh, sure. Um, so the uh, PKLR, uh, the, the functional copy of the, of the gene is inserted using um, uh, uh, something called a lentiviral vector. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a type of a virus that helps deliver the, the functional gene into the stem cells. And that's done in the special lab. Um, Jose Carlos, who's the, the founder of our, the gene therapy program here, uh, can probably provide um, significantly more details uh, than I can, can, can about that. And, and I know we'll have an opportunity to, um, to ask him a couple of questions um, in the, the subsequent part of the presentation. Oh, Paulina, I'm sorry. Do you mind going back to the previous slide? Um, so the, as I mentioned, the, the gene um, product will be manufactured um, in, a, in a special lab and that process takes uh, approximately uh, 12 weeks. Once the uh, special quality checks are conducted on the gene, uh, gene therapy product, um, patients will be readmitted uh, to the hospital have additional blood work uh, performed and have a special I IV placed called the central catheter. Um, it will be placed in a large vein um, under anesthesia by a surgeon. And this, this will be used to deliver a type of chemotherapy called busulfan over a period of several days. The chemotherapy helps to remove the existing stem cells from the patient's bone marrow and make more room for the gene corrected stem cells. Following administration of busulfan, uh, the patient will then receive the gene-corrected cells by infusion through the same catheter. The patient will remain in the hospital and be monitored closely for approximately five to six weeks. And during this period, um, uh, they'll be receiving um, several blood tests and other assessments while the new stem cells engraft in the bone marrow and make new blood cells and the patient recovers from the effects of chemotherapy. After discharge from the hospital, um, patients will be monitored uh, frequently in the subsequent uh, weeks and months. Um, patients will need to return uh, for follow-up visits that which are essential to monitoring if the therapy is working, assessing for any negative effects. We do hope that we will be able to show that gene therapy is not only safe, but also that it's effective. Um, we'd like to see that there is evidence of gene-corrected cells in both the blood and the bone marrow of the patient, that there is reduction or elimination of blood transfusion requirements um, in patients who had previously required transfusions, and that there is improvement of anemia and reduced uh, red blood cell uh, breakdown. One question that we uh, commonly uh, get is, is what does it cost uh, to participate in the gene therapy study? Um, and at Rocket, um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to um, provide um, travel arrangements, hotel, hotel accommodations for patients, as well as a family member and allowances for incidentals um, uh, while patients are participating on the study. Go to the next slide, Paulina. Um, so the phase one uh, clinical study is taking place at three centers um, in Spain and in the US. Um, adult patients will be treated at Hospital Universitario Fundacion Jimenez Diaz with Dr. Jose Luis Lopez Lorenzo as the PI and at Stanford University with Dr. Ami Shah as the PI. Children will be treated at Hospital Nino Jesus with Dr. Julian Sevilla as the principal investigator and by Dr. Shah at Stanford University. Um, our investigators are, who are with us today are all highly skilled and compassionate physicians and transplant experts who really have extensive experience taking care of patients with difficult to treat diseases and we'll have the opportunity to hear them answer several of the important questions we've received. Okay. 
Um, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, you know, we have been getting so many really good questions. Um, a lot of these questions will be answered during the live panel Q&A. Um, so we will get to them. And if we don't, we will, we will try to get to some of the most important ones um, that we can in the time that we have. If not, we will email um, the, the folks who have been asking these questions. So please continue to submit your questions. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take some time to welcome Alejandra and her son, Jonathan. They have been um, instrumental, as I had said before, in helping shape this meeting. They have helped um, to um, spread the word within the patient and family community about this event. Um, we have not publicized it broadly, only through patients and families. And they have also helped us um, to obtain questions to answer for this meeting, which we have inserted in the next part of the presentation. But wanted to take a few minutes um, to speak with them because um, Alejandra is, um, she helps, uh, she has um, led a Facebook group here in the US, which has a lot of international um, patients and families um, and, and provide support to them. She is also uh, forming a foundation, a PKD uh, focused foundation towards the end of this year, which is a lot of work. Um, and she is um, a full time, she works full time. She is a mom of three boys, one of whom has P um, PKD and is forming this foundation. So it's really kudos to Alejandra for all of the work that she's doing. Um, speaking with Alejandra and Jonathan over the past few months, I call them the dynamic duo. They are amazing in terms of where they are today, um, from where they were in their story, from where they have come from 15 years ago. Um, Alejandra, could you please um, share with us your journey? Um, because I don't think everybody has heard your story, how um, you have um, come to where you are today with Jonathan and his PKD. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we started a Years ago, of course, as uh, many of the patients with PKD, uh, our journey started when he was born. He was not doing really good. Uh, six hours later, he had jaundice and his hemoglobin was dropping down. Bilirubin was going up. So he was moved to uh, ICU. And so that's kind of a start our journey, trying to figure out what was going on why he was doing that. Then the doctors come like, I think that we need to do an exchange transfusion, uh, phototherapy. So we, we started with all this and he was in oxygen and it, it was like a little nightmare when you are expecting to have a healthy child that you're going to be hugging and keeping it next to you. Well, that was not the case. Um, and like two months later, uh, after a series of uh, testing and everything. The doctors were like, well, we don't know exactly what is going on with him. And one of the doctors was like, well, he, I don't want to give you a lot of hope, but I don't think that this kid is going to last so much longer. He's, um, he's not doing any good. His oxygen levels dropped. It, it's really bad. Um, and we still can't find, figure out what is wrong with him. Uh, I guess in that moment, my determination kicks in um, as a mother, and as a Hispanic woman, and, and the strength that I guess I had it, and I guess everyone we had it, it's just that we don't show it in the right moment, and in this moment it kicks in. And I tried to do the best I was able to because I was decided that my son was not going to die. Um, so we, we started to look and it started to, tried to find many people, as many people as I could have with PKD, it was zero, nobody. So I started to put messages online that whoever wanted. So I had it, um, a very good response from somebody in the Netherlands that I, I really appreciate. I have two people in the group that I really appreciate all their help because I learned from them so many things. But then Jonathan started to grow up in all his, medical uh, started to get a more frustrating because it was not an answer for anything. And 
I was just kept making questions and every question I had it on wall that, well, we don't know. We don't know anything was that we don't know. Um, but the time that he was five years old, he had it already like, um, I don't know, four um, surgeries already. They removed his gallbladder, they removed his spleen, mm -hmm. then they removed his tonsils. Mm -hmm. um, they had to put a fork head. Mm -hmm. uh, his lungs collapsed during surgery because it was too much. Um, it, it, it was just like a mom nonstop visits to the hospital. And on top of that, every year we had problems with um, what is it called? Um, every year. Oh, yeah, it was pneumonia. Right? Pneumonia. Yeah, every year they, I got pneumonia for some reason. Yeah, and he didn't get a pneumonia just once. He got a pneumonia and it was like two, three weeks at the hospital. Come back home two, three weeks and go back to the hospital for another two, three weeks for pneumonia. And that was a serious, like four times a year. And it, it was really scary because of course during the pneumonia time he had it to be in oxygen and then they were thinking oh he's fine now he can go home and the very last minute again his oxygen drops out with that said we moved to a different hospital because after they uh the first hospital where we were there's like yeah. children's hospital of detroit like oh there is nothing else that we can do we did everything it was possible it's like you cannot just tell me that it's all you can do. It's a lot of other problems. I can see it. I, I saw it. And you just told me that nothing else. So we move. Um, we went to Chicago to visit another doctor to get a different opinion. Uh, this doctor was really amazing. Um, Dr. Thompson uh, in Children's Hospital in Chicago. And she refers to the University of Michigan to meet another doctor, a specialist in bone marrow transplant, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Campbell, that is now um, the head of Washington, Washington DC for children. sickle cell. Um, so he's, they both make this team together. They start to look at Jonathan. They talk to me. They spend hours talking to us and listening and referring to Jonathan, not like a child. They were actually talking to him like a human being, explaining them every single thing, not just to me, but to him. So we we were out of there very happy and they started, we need to make an assessment of everything in Jonathan. So from- Because wasn't it the children's hospital? I think I had like my whole file and everything about all my list of complications. They didn't want to give it to U of M. They didn't want to transfer us. So they refused to give the file. So we went to U of M anyways, and they had to like retest everything. Reassess everything. And on the top of the reassessment and everything on Jonathan, they throw more tests. They wanted to see if Jonathan actually was really eligible for a bone marrow transplant and what was the risk involved in the bone marrow transplant. So they didn't jump and say, yeah, let's do a bone marrow transplant. No, they, they wanted to make sure that he was eligible to have a bone marrow transplant. It was the pros and the cons, why we couldn't do it, why it was a good idea to do it. So it was a really great experience because they put a team together of different specialists for Jonathan. And then every time that something new was coming up, Jonathan was involved in his own career. And I just said, Jonathan needs to know what is going on. Jonathan needs to understand because one day I'm going to die. I don't know if this is going to be tomorrow or next year or probably in 20 years, only in 50 years, I don't know. But he needs to be responsible. He needs to understand what it means. Because at the end, I'm not the one that is sick. I'm not the one that I suffer with him, but I don't suffer what he's suffering. So it's a big difference in to suffer with him than to suffer yourself, what you're going through. And I wanted for him to understand that nothing that he says we need to disregard it. Because a lot of times we have the tendency, oh, that person is worse than me. This person is having something worse than me. It's not true because you, you are part of this world. You, we need to understand that our kids, they have feelings. Um, the other person that I was telling you is Jennifer. And she told me when I met her that it was a wonderful experience. 
and we make a wonderful click that we are working out together for this foundation. But Jennifer and I, we, we click and she started to talk to me as a patient and another patient. And one day she told me, um, a lot of times I didn't tell my mom how I was feeling because I didn't want her to feel hurt. I didn't want to hurt my mother. And I got in my head so badly that I was like, I'm a mother. And I don't want that, that my son had to see. And I, Jennifer didn't say it like to try to bother her mom. It, it was her experience of, as a child with PKD. So he immediately put her in Jonathan's thoughts, even when he wasn't thinking about it, was, he said, I don't want that. I want my son to have the ability to speak up for himself. I know there's kids that probably they don't have that ability. And Jonathan is being really smart in been very involved in every single thing that we do. He talks to the doctors, he debate with them whether he has this or that, or uh, he was diagnosed. Uh, kind of funny, half the time I'm right. I, what is it? <laughs> the first time I think we were diagnosed, or I was diagnosed with diabetes, and I was thinking that my pancreas was totally fine. There's no way I have diabetes. And, you know, it kind of was back and forth for a while until they decided to do a test, which was like a glucose sugar test or whatever. They did several tests. Several tests. And it ended up that I didn't have diabetes specifically. I had something else, beta cell dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, Jonathan started to get more, getting more involved, learning more from the doctors, asking more questions. And I've just been stepping back more and more watching him growing and giving give him that power if that makes sense i think i think that's very powerful alejandra because um we have i've actually recently spoken with three families who have newly diagnosed um, children four years old six years old uh, with pkd and they feel really alone. And it's a, really a testament to you to hear just Jonathan today to see how empowered he is and um, such a educated young man around his disease to be able to talk to his physicians. I know Dr. Grace um, sees a lot of um, pediatric um, patients with PKD and um, it's really it's really wonderful. And we'll hear from her around the work that she's doing with um, the natural history, but we're learning a lot about the science of the disease and how it's progressing. And then from um, folks like you and Jonathan and our, and our incredible PKD patient community. Um, so thank you so much, Alejandra and Jonathan for sharing your story today. Um, I think we could probably go an entire hour interviewing you. <laughs> um, but I know that there are um, a lot of questions that have been coming in through the chat and also that have come in previous to the webinar starting. Um, before we get started in the next section, could I take an opportunity to ask um, I, Dr. Eileen Nicoletti to answer one question because it has to do with a question that we're not gonna be addressing, which is around eligibility. So what if I am transfusion dependent but haven't had my spleen removed, am I still eligible? Sure, thanks Latika, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so at present in this uh, current study, um, we're only evaluating gene therapy uh, in patients who are transfusion dependent um, despite having had their spleen removed. Um, and that is, uh, you know, in part uh, because this is a, a phase one, one study and that the purpose um, of, of it really is to evaluate um, uh, safety. Um, and since uh, splenectomy is, is one of the standards uh, of care um, for, for some PKD patients, um, we're, we're only uh, investigating the therapy in splenectomized patients. Um, my, my hope is that um, if we can demonstrate that the therapy is effective, um, we'll be able to uh, open another trial and investigate the gene therapy um, in patients who still have their spleens. Thank you so much, Eileen. And I know there's a lot of other questions that have come in, but I hope that we will get to them in some of the questions that are already listed on the slides coming up. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please, Paulina. 
Um, we wanted to just have one more quick polling question really quickly. Um, when considering enrolling in the gene therapy clinical trial, what factors are important to you? And here you can pick multiple choices. So how close the treatment center is to your home, familiarity with the treatment center, COVID-19 and travel, side effects, receiving placebo, none of the above or other. about uh, five more seconds. Okay. Thank you so much to those who voted and um, and and really considering gene therapy trial, it's it's a big decision and um, and it looks like side effects are the number one um, concern, um, really being educated around what they would be. And then also lifestyle considerations around um, proximity to the treatment center, um, COVID-19. Um, so thank you so much for that. I think um, we, we will definitely keep those things in mind as we um, progress through the rest of the presentation, as well as as we progress through our program, the gene therapy program. So um, without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to our um, expert panel. They, um, I've been working with them um, for some, uh, for the past couple of weeks, as well as some of them for the past few months. And I have to tell you, they are um, incredible um, human beings um, with what they do with our patients and, and the work that they are doing, transformative work that they are doing in the PKD and gene therapy space. We have Dr. Ami Shah from Stanford. She is a pediatric hematologist oncologist. She is one of our principal investigators. Um, she has been working in um, cellular therapies for treating rare genetic disorders over um, a number of years. She is highly experienced and, and we are really honored to have her. We have um, Dr. Jose Carlos Segovia, um, uh, who is a I have to say he is really um, the founder of the scientific work um, around gene therapy in PKD. Um, it is the basis of his work and his lab's work that is the um, that we that had helped us get the IND, the investigational new drug application in the US FDA for um, the PKD program to move um, to treating humans um, with gene therapy. So it, he is an expert. Um, he is also um, uh, going to um, record a video around the work that he's done and we will be sharing that with the community. So that is, um, we're really honored to have um, Jose Carlos with us as well. We have Dr. Rachel Grace, um, I'm so excited to have her. Um, you may have heard from Dr. Rachel Grace at the patient-focused drug development meeting um, that NORD had held last year. She is a, also a pediatric hematologist oncologist at Dana-Farber in Boston. Um, she treats um, uh, uh, pediatric patients with PKD, but also some adults. Um, and she is leading the natural history study um, and learning so much about the disease and it's really shaping the science um, and, and how we treat it. Um, so we're really excited to have her and she's gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we have Dr. Julian Sevilla from Madrid. Um, he is one of our principal investigators as well. He has a lot of experience um, around the gene therapy program. He um, sees um, he, a lot of the questions that have come in. Um, Dr. Sevilla would be a really good person to answer because of the experience that he has. Um, I've been working with Dr. Sevilla for a number of months now, and um, he's a very dedicated um, physician. Um, to our pediatric community. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Jose Luis Lopez Lorenzo, who is um, a very special part of our, um, our uh, 
gene therapy program because he has treated the first patient in the PKD gene therapy trial. Um, so he is very knowledgeable. Um, he's actually has real world um, experience. Um, he will be sharing some of the highlights that we can share at this point. Please note that um, Dr. Lopez Lorenzo can't share everything yet, even though we want to, because we have a presentation coming up at a scientific conference at the end of the year. Once that presentation has been made public, I will come back um, with the patient community along with Alejandra um, to share those results. So if we could go to the next slide, please. The first question is, why is gene therapy being investigated as a potential option for treating PKD? Um, Dr. Um, Segovia, would you like to um, help answer this question and maybe Dr. Grace also add to it? Yes, yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, we consider uh, PKD as a potential uh, disease to be treated uh, by gene therapy because uh, it has all the characteristics that are required for a, a gene therapy, for a disease uh, eligible for gene therapy. We, we knew his gene, the new, we knew that the, the gene that uh, produces the, the disease, uh, uh, we, we knew it, we knew what, what was it, we have it cloned and we could uh, uh, use it uh, for the generation of tools to for the treatment of uh, gene therapy. And also uh, we established some uh, preliminary experiments in, in animal models, mainly in mice, and we saw that the tools that we've been developed were working, uh, were being really efficacious for the, for the uh, in treatment of the disease. So, so we thought that could be a very good option to go on and to, uh, and to put this in, in, in the clinics to, 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 to investigate if it could be also a good option for patients. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, how well is the gene therapy working in the clinical trial for PKD? I think one of the most popular questions I have gotten. So here, I would love to have um, Dr. Uh, Lopez Lorenzo um, help answer this, as well as Dr. Eileen Nicoletti. I think maybe, Eileen, you can start, but... You know, the answer to this question is gene therapy is working for a lot of uh, genetic disease that are related with just one gene that is uh, mutated and altered. So we can change by, by uh, really uh, putting into the uh, genetic uh, background of the patient a new normal gene. That, that is what we are trying to do in this trial. And I will uh, really thank to Dr. Segovia for allowing us to participate in this trial because it has been a very uh, great experience doing uh, this trial and really seeing how the patient uh, have a great uh, moment seeing uh, a good uh, a good evolution of the of the disease. So for me, really, it has been a very interesting uh, experience. For an um. Th thank you, uh, Jose Luis. Um, so as Latika mentioned, um, our first adult patient was taking, was treated um, in July um, with the um, investigational gene therapy under the care of uh, Dr. Lopez Lorenzo. Um, 
the patient uh, tolerated the infusion well. Um, and as Latika uh, discussed, um, it, it's still early in the patient's post-transplant course, um, but we're hopeful in the next uh, several weeks, we'll be able to share more information um, at a larger conference and then with the, um, with the, the patient community. Um, so the, the clinical sites in the study um, include uh, um, Hospital um, Universitario Fundacion Jimenez Diaz in Madrid, Spain. Um, that was where the first patient was treated. Um, additional clinical sites in the study um, include Stanford University um, that will be that are that will be treating adult and pediatric patients, and also um, with Dr. Ami Shah as the PI, and uh, Hospital uh, Nino Jesus in Madrid, Spain, that will treat um, children um, with Dr. Julian Sevilla as the PI. I know that was a question that came in, so I just wanted to make sure that the clinical sites were clarified. Um, I, I did briefly mention this um, at the tail end of the presentation that I gave, but I, I did want to also um, uh, reiterate that Rocket um, will be providing um, financial support uh, for patients and families to participate in the trial um, and will be able to support um, hotel accommodations, uh, travel, and reimburse for meals and, and incidentals. Um, that was another uh, question that had uh, come up and I wanted to make sure that that, that was uh, stated. And I know we have um, patients um, who are interested from all parts of the world um, and, and physicians have contacted us because English may not be their first language. So we will help support with uh, translation services as well. Um, the next question, a uh, couple of questions similar are, um, what are the potential risks to the gene therapy and what are the potential side effects of the gene therapy? Here, um, Dr. Sevilla and um, Dr. Nicoletti, could you help answer these questions, please? Sure, Aline, I guess you may go first. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, gene therapy is still experimental. And, um, so we don't know all of the potential risks. Um, some risks um, that have been, that are possible um, uh, include the fact that in theory, um, there is a possibility that the viral vector that is used to deliver the corrected gene um, could possibly contaminate the cells with another virus. Um, we, we do think this is very unlikely to occur um, as a result of all the extensive testing that is performed on the gene therapy product. Um, our, the patients will also, um, who are in the trial are also closely monitored for this uh, following gene therapy. Um, an additional risk, um, which I think um, was also brought up uh, in the chat as one of the questions, um, is the possibility that when we insert the PKLR gene um, into the DNA of the cells, there is a chance um, that the insertion of the new gene um, could cause some abnormal gene, uh, abnormal activity in, in other genes. Um, in gene therapy studies using a different type of virus called a gamma retrovirus, not, not, the, lentiviral, uh, not the lentivirus that's used in this study, a small number of patients um, had developed blood cancer or leukemia. And so as a result of this, uh, clinical trials using that older vector, the gamma retrovirus, uh, was stopped. And since the development of the lentiviral vectors, uh, like the one used in this study, over 500 uh, patients with different blood and immune disorders uh, have received um, gene-modified cells um, uh, using this type of vector with no development of uh, leukemia. Um, you know, these, ris these risks um, and other risks of gene therapy will, will be discussed uh, with patients and families in detail by the treating physician um, as part of the informed consent uh, process. So I'll, I'll stop there um, and, and let Dr. Sevilla add, add to this. 
Well, uh, yeah, just to go, because we have a lot of questions, but I, I seen that we have a lot of questions regarding the vectors, regarding the gene therapy itself. That is, would be, it would be quite a, a smart questions, but uh, probably we need more time to, to discuss those things. And it would be easier to send an email answer this. But the main, I, I've read one question about if this is the same approach of gene therapy that those that have the, uh, the clinical trials that have some patients dying over the last months. And this is a completely different approach. And the patients who died in over the last months were adenovirus uh, uh, gene therapy, which is uh, adenovirus associated, which is a completely different approach of this. This is a lentiviral vector to be uh, introduced in the uh, hematopoietic stem cells to uh, recover all the hematopoietic system to treat these kind of uh, diseases that were uh, mainly related with uh, hematological diseases. Uh, and in that way, uh, this is not the, the same trial, this is not the same approach of those uh, trials with adenovirus associated uh, genes. So uh, the, the main question that we have here is that, and I guess that what you have to think is, this is a completely different approach and we are not dealing with, although this is gene therapy, is not the same thing. And all the other questions related to gene therapy, I guess that it would be better to answer them uh, one by one. Right, wonderful. Um, we, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, we have we have a very educated PKD community here, um, and they they're reading things about the gene therapy program, and they're asking questions like. What is mobilization? What is myoablation? Um, and why are these needed? And what are the side effects? Um, if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to tee it up for Dr. Amit Shah. Um, Dr. Amit Shah, um, in the chat, as you go through these four steps um, uh, as part of the gene therapy pro clin clinical trial program, would you mind also covering busulfan? Because a couple of questions have come in in the chat around um, what are some of the side effects of busulfan and if there are any fertility concerns um, related with it. Yeah, great. Um, so mobilization is actually in step two, which is the stem cell collection. And what we do for mobilization is we, uh, patients receive something called GCSF as well as plerixifor. Those two agents allow all the stem cells to grow really, really high so that they can spill out into our peripheral blood from our bone marrow. And when it gets into the peripheral blood, we can collect it from, our, from an IV as opposed to having to do bone marrow harvest. The side effects of doing GCSF and plerixifor are actually not too much, other than you might have some bony pain because your white count's going to go up very high. Um, once the stem cells are collected, those bony pains go away. Um, and it's this is a procedure we do on numerous patients where we collect stem cells, um, and it's been relatively safe for most patients. In terms of the myeloablation, that occurs in, st in step number three, which is called the conditioning. As well, I lead, Dr. Nicoletti's talked about earlier, we give myeloablation to make room in our bone marrow for the new stem cells to grow, okay? If the bone marrow, if your bone marrow already has enough stem cells, there is no room for the gene modified cells to grow and then this wouldn't work. So we give four doses of abuse, four days worth of abuse self and to the patients to get rid of everything in the bone marrow so that the new stem cells will start and take hold. There are side effects of busulfan, um, and, and in particular, um, this busulfan is used frequently in bone marrow transplantation patients um, for many, many years, um, and it's a relatively, it's one of the more common chemotherapy agents that we give patients for bone marrow transplant purposes. Um, there are side effects for these agents, although you're, the patients on this particular trial will only get four days of busulfan, so they're not having multiple drugs given to make the side effects worse. Um, in terms of fertility, which is a very, very good question, um, we don't have a great answer yet about fertility with using busulfan. The, we do have some patients who have had children, and, and again, when I talk about this, I'm taking it from historical data about patients who have been treated for primarily leukemia. 
um, or for other genetic diseases and received a bone marrow transplantation from somebody besides themselves. Um, so this is a little bit different because we don't have enough follow-up data on patients that have received eucelfampra gene therapy and what happens to them long-term in terms of fertility. Um, at this point, um, I have had patients who have had kids after Bucelfan. Um, not too many, though. So I think that you know what happens with this particular trial is that you um, they will talk to you about fertility preservation prior to embarking on a gene therapy a conditioning regimen. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. <clears throat> now, I know we're, that we're coming up um, on time with the hour. If our um, expert panel could stay maybe 15 minutes, um, because there's just a few more questions to get through, um, and the rest of the questions coming in through the chat, we will respond um, by email to the community. Um, the next question is, um, if gene therapy works in PKD, then how long would results last? Dr. Segovia, could you help answer this question? Yes, sure. So the, the idea of the gene therapy uh, is to be a one-shot treatment. And uh, the idea is that, this, uh, that, the, that the result of the treatment will last uh, for uh, the rest, in theory, for, for the rest of the life of the patient. However, this is something that we don't know yet. Uh, in, in, in humans, and that's and this is uh, one of the main objectives of this clinical trial: to understand and to know uh, how long this could be uh, the, the, the the beneficial effects of the uh, of the trial of the therapy are gonna last uh, in patients. So our hope is that the treatment will last uh, for, for, the, for the rest of the life of, of, the, of the treated patients. However, uh, we need to uh, uh, demonstrate this and, we, uh, and this is one of the main objectives of the trial, to know uh, how long this, uh, this treatment, treatment is, is gonna last in the patients. Dr. Segovia, related to um, this question, another question came in through the chat that I have actually received um, as well from the patient community is, is gene therapy the same as CRISPR-Cas9 technique or, technique, or is this different? Uh, oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I can answer some of these technical questions. No, gene therapy is, uh, uh, we, the gene therapy that we are addressing here is an ex vivo gene therapy based on lentiviral vectors, which is different from the uh, CRISPR-Cas technique. The lentiviral vectors uh, will uh, enter into the cell and will interact with the genome of the cells, with the, with the material that, that maintains all the, our genetic uh, characteristics. And this uh, genetic material will be introduced there uh, by means of these uh, lentiviral backbone and lentiviral properties. CRISPR-Cas technology is a different approach, which is, has also uh, a lot of uh, expectations, but uh, it's a different uh, strategy. And apart, apart from this, as, as Julian uh, already mentioned, AAV vectors are completely uh, different than those lentiviral vectors. And also uh, the, uh, the treatment that we are following here is an ex vivo interaction between the vector and the cells. And in, in some in of those AAV uh, trials with, with not very good uh, outcome finally, those are uh, in vivo injections of the lentiviral vector. Of the vector of the adeno associated vector. So, uh, as, as he uh, pointed out clearly, this is a clear, different uh, approach. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sevilla, could you help answer will I still need blood transfusions after gene therapy? Well, that, that's the goal. The goal for, for the patients to be included in the trial is to get it 
of uh, transfusion and to become transfusion independent. However, during the what we call the, the transplantation of the phase or the autologous transplant phase, if they receive conditioning regimen, what we should expect is to uh, at least receive some transfusion in the early days after the infusion of the corrected cells. Meanwhile, they begin to work. I don't know if Rachel wants to add something here. I, I would echo what you said, that that would be the goal of gene therapy, would be to, um, to become transfusion independent if it's successful. All right, wonderful, thank you. And then the next question, Dr. Nicoletti, when will the trial enroll younger patients? Sure. Um, we're hoping to start enrolling patients, younger patients uh, in 2021, so next year. Um, you know, for ethical reasons, before we start enrolling these, these younger patients, we, we need to establish uh, safety. And also, um, you know, we'd like to have it, see evidence of preliminary efficacy um, uh, before we, in adult patients, before we, we enroll our pediatric patient. And I would love to stay in contact um, with the patients and the families um, so that when the trial does open up to the next um, younger cohort, um, I could inform you and let you know. Uh, Dr. Grace, uh, what have you learned so far from the PKD natural history study? And then maybe just maybe give one minute around um, what is a natural history study? Sure. Um, so the pyruvate kinase deficiency natural history study um, was an international registry, mainly in North America and Europe, that enrolled um, about 250 individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency. And that enrollment happened between 2014 and 2017 and was open at about 30 centers in five countries. Um, and uh, natural history studies are uh, registry studies um, that have the goal to better understand the spectrum of symptoms and complications in a rare disorder like pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, and the overarching goals are to um, find out how patients are currently diagnosed and monitored and managed to improve the diagnosis, monitoring and management in the, in, in the condition in the future. And um, the number of um, individuals who enrolled in the natural history study for pyruvate kinase deficiency really speaks to the efforts of, of this community um, and the interest um, in all of you in, in this condition. And, um, and it's um, with great appreciation that we all have um, for all the people who participated so that we could help to learn to manage patients um, better going forward. And um, through this natural history study, we've already learned a number of things some of which I'll highlight here. Um, one is that it's, it's a difficult diagnosis to make, that um, there are um, many individuals who are diagnosed late in childhood or in adulthood because of difficulties with um, enzyme testing, that it's not available everywhere, it's difficult to do or can't be done in the setting of transfusions, and also um, even the difficulties of genetic testing where up to 20% of people who enrolled in the natural history study had a, a newly described mutation. And it can be difficult to know if that mutation is disease causative. And up to 10% who wanted to enroll um, only had one mutation or didn't have any detected mutations, even though they had a clinical diagnosis of pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, we're also learning from the natural history study about common complications that, that people seem to have and also about more rare complications. Um, and who should be monitored for those. Um, some of those include iron overload. So we know that if you get transfusions, that there's um, the risk of developing iron overload in, in everybody. But we see now too how high the frequency is of iron overload, even in people who've never been transfused or only have had a few transfusions. And this can happen in childhood too. And so we've really recognized the importance of monitoring at every age um, and in both genders, um, including in people who are not transfused. We've also recognized um, that there's a higher rate of, of issues with bone density and that that can also occur at a younger age than we typically think of um, individuals being monitored, um, high rate of gallstones and the natural history of those in terms of splenectomy and also um, the rate of pulmonary hypertension and the um, symptoms that go along with, with that complication. 
Um, we've also learned more about um, what happens after splenectomy in terms of the response to splenectomy and also the risk of complications after splenectomy, including thrombosis and infection. We've looked at the relationship between genotype, the PKLR um, uh, mutations that somebody has in their, um, in their disease features to see if that can help to, to provide some expectations or, or prognosis um, for families with a new child with pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, and we've, we've learned a lot, a lot and, a, and, and there's a lot of not mentioning here, um, but we have so much left to learn, as you all know. Um, and I'm often asked about a, a new issue somebody has or something that's not been described, and could that be related to pyruvate kinase deficiency? Um, and I would just encourage all of you who are listening to consider participating in, in, in the registry in, in this condition, just so that we can continue to learn more and continue to improve our, our monitoring and management. The registry that's open now um, is called the PEAK Registry. Um, and there's a, a video recording that I made that has information about the PEAK Registry, if you'd like to hear more about it, or you're welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to tell you more about it. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Grace. You are collecting a wealth of information. Um, some of that information would help inform um, gene therapy clinical trials. Could you, could you spend 30 seconds just to explain how um, your information helps inform um, clinical therapy trials? So the, the information from registries um, in pyruvate kinase deficiency, but in other rare diseases too, really helps to form um, questions for trials. What are, what are the important outcomes that would um, unmet needs that people have in the condition? Um, and to better understand how um, it cur the disease currently manifests um, throughout the spectrum um, of in individuals who have it um, and how they're currently managed. So for example, having a better understanding of the transfusion frequency um, and effect of splenectomy and pyruvate kinase deficiency has been helpful in, um, in, in trials in this condition and figuring out um, what would be an important outcome in terms of um, uh, transfusions beforehand and transfusions afterwards to, to say that a treatment was successful. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have time for two more questions um, and these are really specific questions that have come in from patients about their own specific cases. Um, maybe Dr. Grace and Dr. Lopez Lorenzo, if you could help answer, is there a natural alternative to chelation therapy for those who just can't tolerate um, chelation therapy agents? I can I can try to answer that first. Um, I think um, you know, as I just mentioned, the iron overload, as you all know, occurs in everybody who gets transfused, but is definitely also a complication we see um, in pyruvate kinase deficiency. Even if you haven't been transfused, so it's just so important that everybody has monitoring for iron overload. And in the in the U.S., we currently have three approved chelation medications. Um, for, for iron overload. And, um, and those are differentially tolerated and effective for patients and often or sometimes have to be used in combination. Another approach um, outside of those three medications in the US that are approved that we sometimes consider in people who have iron overload is phlebotomy, um, a process of removing blood um, and, and with it the iron. This is um, a challenge in people who are anemic and often not well tolerated. And so it's more of an approach for people who have a genetic form of what's called hemochromatosis more than for people who are anemic. Um, and then um, there has been a description of an of approach in patients who are not yet iron overloaded, but need transfusions to consider something like exchange transfusions um, in order to try to avoid iron overload. Uh, this question is more though about natural al alternatives. And there is some um, literature, medical literature, um, about um, agents that are um, phytochemicals and flavonoids like black peas and berries and nuts. Um, and they have some iron binding properties that have made people wonder whether they could be used as chelators. Um, but none of them have been rigorously studied in trials. And it's um, right now uh, not thought that those are effective enough to really 
take the place of, of the um, chelation approaches, the, the medical therapies that we currently have in terms of um, really uh, removing iron well enough in people who have significant iron overload. Well, here in Europe, we have the same option that they have in United States. So I agree completely with Grace. No, I don't have a different approach to iron chelation right now than the one she mentioned before. Thank you so much. And then our final question for the day, and I wanted to see if Dr. Grace or Dr. Shaw could help answer this question. A patient has asked, um, are, do you have any other medicinal suggestions to reduce um, bilirubin further? Alcohol and lack of sleep are, um, are increasing my bilirubin and I don't understand why. You want me to start? I can start and I'll, um, in terms of alcohol, alcohol is cleared through the liver, um, which is why your bilirubin goes up when you drink too much alcohol. So we recommend that you don't drink any alcohol and I, I, and I get it. It's, it's nice to have that sometimes with your meals, but um, in terms of trying to protect your liver the much as, as much as possible, alcohol is actually one of the worst offenders. Um, what we want to avoid in patients who have ineffective erythropoiesis, which is what patients with PKD have, is um, to avoid having cirrhosis or fibrosis in their liver specifically. And so anything that's cleared through the liver or toxic to the liver should be avoided. Wonderful. I would just, um, I, sorry, I would just add to that too, that um, for some people, um, the, in, in addition to the hemolysis, um, bilirubin comes from red cell breakdown um, and is metabolized, um, uh, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, in the liver. Um, in addition to red cell breakdown being a part of that process for everyone who has pervic kinase deficiency, some individuals have co-inheritance of a, um, a, a common genetic variant called Gilbert syndrome, um, and that can compound the, the degree of um, elevated bilirubin that people have when, with hemolytic anemias like pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, and then um, with that, there can be an effect of increased bilirubin at times where somebody's more stressed, um, is dehydrated, um, or gets sick, which are also times for people who have pyruvate kinase deficiency where there can be more hemolysis. So those types of situations, particularly for people also who have um, Gilbert syndrome can be times of a higher bilirubin level. Um, and so it may be that that is also contributing with the lack of sleep being a, a, a part of the process. Um, and in terms of medicinal suggestions, um, we don't have great therapies for lowering bilirubin. Um, I just mentioned that splenectomy for pyruvate kinase deficiency doesn't lower bilirubin. So um, that's not an indication for splenectomy in this condition. Um, there are, are medicines that can reduce um, bilirubin by helping with metabolism like phenobarbital, but medications like that have the potential for side effects. And so it really needs to be considered when thinking about what the, the risk benefit is of, of, of that type of approach. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Nicoletti, if we could just squeeze in one more question, I think this is worth um, answering. And um, there's a question that came in, is there a higher risk of complications with gene therapy if someone's splenectomized? Oh, okay, I just thought, I thought I wasn't really sure if I was aware. Um, no, I think that, um, you know, when you're splenectomized, um, you're probably gonna be able to engraft a lot faster because there won't be any cells that will be trapped into the spleen. So um, I don't anticipate any reason why gene therapy would be less effective or more toxic um, for pa those patients. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think what we're going to do is um, we are um, actively um, capturing all of the questions that have come in through the chat and the Q&A, and we will get back to the community on that. So I'm really going to end on one slide. Um, if we could go to the next to last slide, um, Paulina, please. Um, so, so first I wanted to say that um, 
Rocket has hired me a few months ago um, as a patient advocate. Um, I am your voice um, within our company and across our five programs. I talk to patients every day. I talk to our clinicians. I talk to our advocates and I make sure that your voice is heard and that your voice is represented as we are planning our gene therapy clinical trials. Um, I am also a connector. So if you come to us with questions, I will connect to you with the right people um, to get information or to get your questions answered. Um, no question and no email will be left unanswered. So please do reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns. Um, more information about the clinical trials can be found on the clinicaltrials.gov link. Um, and then there is also some information on our website um, uh, that you can find about PKD. So please do um, reach out to us. Um, and uh, we really wanted to um, spend another minute to thank our panel of experts here. They are calling in in their afternoons, evenings, middays from Spain, the East Coast, the West Coast. Um, and I really wanna thank them because they have spent time preparing um, answers um, to be able to come today and, and answer the questions that have come in beforehand. Um, and they will also be helping us answer some questions um, afterwards. So thank you so much to our panel of experts. Um, we really thank you. And last but not least, Thank you so much, Alejandra. Thank you so much, Jonathan, um, representing the patient and the family community. Um, you are a testament of what um, a ideal um, mother and son duo could be for those who are newly diagnosed right now um, to be 15, 10, 15 years down the line um, and the work that you are doing. And congratulations on the formation of your foundation. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you on that. And thank you so much, everybody, um, to my colleagues as well. Thank you. Latika, 10 seconds just to, to give thank you to those Spanish speakers that are uh, asking about the translation. Muchas gracias por conectar todos los eh, hispanohablantes y como os ha dicho Paulina, os pasaremos todo traducido. Muchas gracias. Gracias. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, we will close out and we will be in touch with videos and answers to questions in the coming week.